Okay, so it's uh, 4 p.m., so we start uh, to finish early and get back into the sun. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I know outside is very nice, and I appreciate that you took the time to go into this dark little cave and listen to me ramble on for about 40 minutes. I try to be as quick as possible, so we have time to discuss it or can go outside where it's nice. Um, through the Google Glass and what Malice found there, uh, obviously this talk is about Google Glass, but since not many, but some people in this room uh, do not know me. My name is Tante. Um, you can reach me at, on, on Twitter and many other social uh, network uh, services as Tante. Um, Tante.cc is my blog where most of the stuff I do is, is linked. Um, I'm a scientist. I study computer science and philosophy. Um, and uh, in Germany, I'm mostly known, if I'm known at all, for being one of those post-privacy people who uh, do not cling to the old idea of privacy and who reflect how the changing technological landscape that we live in changes many perceptions of how we work together, how we live together, how we communicate and that kind of stuff. Um, so the topic of how the digital world and how technology changes us uh, is basically with me every day. Um, in my job, not as much as I'd love to, but you know, you gotta make do with what's possible. Um, I don't just have a title that I didn't even write myself but had the, the crowd uh, write for me because um, I suck with titles, but I have a second one, I have a subtitle. Um, regulating technology and data use. And that's really what we're talking about today. Um, the, how do we regulate technology? How do we, we regulate uh, how data can be used, should be used? And is it the same? Do, do the same principles apply? Um, the, the topic of regulation is really not a popular topic um, because whenever you regulate, whenever you create a rule for whatever re reason, for whatever aspect of life, you piss someone off because at some point you will hinder someone in, in doing what, whatever they want at that point in time. Maybe they want to pay their, their uh, employees just one, one dollar an hour and you say, no, you can't do that. We have a minimum wage. Um, or you say, somebody says, yeah, I just want to park here. I'm not disturbing anyone, but we have a regulation and that person can't, can't uh, sit there. So um, regulation is, is always about restrictions in a certain way, which especially in this hacker community that has always had and still has sort of a libertarian vibe going on where, you know, now nah, the government, they're just messing around in the stuff that we know about. We probably all read this declaration of the uh, independence of cyberspace where uh, uh, John Perry Barlow basically said, yeah, you know, let's just us do our thing here. Don't regulate, just go away. We know what we're doing and it's gonna be fine. Um, so regulation is a hard topic for, for this kind of crowd, I guess. Not because you're stupid or because, you know, you might disagree with me, but because it's something that doesn't really sit well with many of us because we've seen that regulation doesn't work that great all the time. Many people who create the rules that we live by today, especially in Germany where I come from and uh, where I'm most familiar with the, the legal process and with the, the people who are working there, um, they sometimes create rules where we say, yeah, no, that's not gonna fly, that's stupid. And I'm gonna give a few examples of that. Um, but if we want to talk about regulation, let's just take a step back and look at what regulation actually is and where we apply it. If we look at the world, how it is and how we live, we regulate many things. For example, we regulate certain chemicals. Certain chemicals you can't just buy in, in, this, in a store. So if it's, for example, crystal meth, if you have it, people get really angry and certain people uh, will even try to get you and put you into jail. Um, we regulate the economy. You can't just pay whatever you want because we have things like minimum wage. You can't uh, have your employees work 100 hours in uh, a week, at least not in the Western world. If it's in China, we don't care because we want the cheap goodies. Um, you may not build a cartel with your company, so we regulate that space as well. Not as good as we should probably because we see how that turned out in the last few years, but we do regulate that area. We also regulate that area in, in the context of what can you do to the environment if you have a business. You can't just take your toxic waste and dump it in the river, even though the river transports it away and nobody sees it anymore. That's 
somebody's going to get it in, into his or her uh, backyard. Um, another thing we regulate heavily and which often pisses us off, but it works, is traffic, for example. Um, traffic, as we do it here, at, especially in Germany, uh, many people who come to Germany the first time are at awe and scared when they see the amount of signs we have on our roads. Where, you know, you may not drive here and don't look left and whatever. You know, it's we regulate it very heavily. Other um, countries have a different approach there. They regulate way less than that and it still works but here it's very structured and very heavy, heavily regulated you know where to park how fast to drive what you have to do to be allowed to drive certain vehicles um, we have a lot of regulation in that space because I mean for obvious reasons basically and uh, another thing um, uh, an example that we will always come back to is weapons um, as I said I'm from Germany uh, we regulate weapons rather strongly, even though I say not strong enough, but uh, it's really not that simple to get a, a gun here. Other, com uh, other uh, countries have a very different approach there, and you can basically buy a gun for certain reasons. Um, but still, uh, if we talk about Germany, it's very heavy heavily uh, regulated. Only few, uh, few people may have a gun at home, especially if it's one of those. You know, those are not, not sports utilities. Those are... Uh, automatic firearms that are basically meant for war and not for any sort of civil uh, society. So those are the examples that, some of the examples that we regulate every day, but there are way more. I mean, uh, our whole life, the way it's structured, is basically built on regulation. So what is regulation? Uh, regulation, this is again obviously copied from, not again, but this is copied from the Wikipedia, obviously. Most of the quotes I give for definitions here are Wikipedia because yeah. Um, regulation creates limits or constraints a right. It creates or limits a duty or allocates a responsibility. And we can see all those aspects in the examples I gave before. You know, um, you, uh, you have certain rights that we have constructed in our regulation. You, know, you have the right that uh, nobody attacks you. You have the right to uh, of your, uh, having your body physically intact. You have the right to property in most, in most societies that we live in. Um, but those rights are also always uh, restricted in certain aspects. For example, uh, you have the right to live wherever you choose, but if you break certain laws, we might take that right away for a few years and put you in jail. Or you have the right to, uh, um, or you have certain limits to how you can, can enforce your right because you start stepping on the rights of others. Um, uh, duties are also a thing, you know, taxes, we have a regulation for taxes, which are a duty you have to pay, you have to contribute, uh, they are created, they are also limited, you know, you have to pay up to a certain degree, but if the damage you created is higher, you can't even, uh, you don't have to pay it anymore, or that kind of thing. Um, and there's re responsibilities. If you create a certain problem, you know, if you create a certain economical impact, you might have a re certain responsibility to, uh, reduce the impact you had you know there's sometimes uh, if you want to build this this uh, this factory you have to buy create and uh, build sort of a forest area to have the co2 impact uh, covered um, so that's what regulation does it's really a, a set of of rules that governs almost everything we do all day and Many things we love. I mean, whenever we, we read, yes, it creates a right, that's awesome. We have a right to do something, to have something, that's cool. Or it limits a duty. <laughs> Limiting duty is always fun. I mean, we can do more stuff and nobody cares what we do. But there's, it always has the, the other point, you know. It limits our rights. It creates duties. It, it al allocates responsibility. So regulation uh, is always sort of a leash that we tie ourselves with. We cannot do everything anymore. But there are very good reasons to regulate. And I don't want to come off as someone here who doesn't like regulation. I think regulation is very important. And in many areas, as I have already hinted at, we have too little regulation, in fact. In others, we might have too much. So what are the reasons why we regulate? Um, one very important aspect is protection. We want to protect certain weaker entities. And weaker can mean many different things. Sometimes it's children. We have regulation to protect children because we see they might not be able to handle everything that the world might throw at them. So we protect them so they can grow up better. 
Um, it might be that a person is politically not as powerful as another one. For example, we have a government who is very powerful and we have just the individual who is way less powerful. So we have to create a level of protection there. Um, you might be an employee and obviously the company that pays you has a lot of power over you. So we have to create a regulation there. Um, then there's the old discussion about the general will and the will of all, as uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau called it. Um, just as a quick explanation, um, the difference is the will of all is uh, we all want not to pay taxes because paying taxes is taking away money from us. We could buy cool stuff with that. But as a community, we have the will that taxes are being paid because we like roads and firefighters and all that kind of stuff. So the regulation tries to, to re formulate and enforce this sort of general will, this will that we as an individual might not really have, but as a community we do have. Um, then there's always this interest group transfers is something that sounds very fishy or weird, an interest group. Huh? It's basically about shifting wealth around. So you have groups of people that have very little money, you have groups of people that have more money, so you build a tax code that tries to shift some of the money from the uh, rich people over to the people who have way too little to live. Um, in different uh, programs, you know. Every country has their own program there, obviously. obviously. Um, and another reason why we uh, regulate, and that's obviously connected to the protection aspect, the third one. Um, we have weak people uh, that cannot defend themselves or who cannot create their own, uh, s sustain their own life, so we have to make sure that they have the resources to survive in a meaningful and, and fair way. And there's the aspect of uh, irre irreversi irreversibility. And that's basically this whole, we only borrowed the world from our kids. So we create regulation not to destroy the earth because some of us might have kids and we might want them to live longer than 30 years, um, which I can understand even though I don't have kids. Um, there are obviously more reasons why we have to regulate, but those are the, those are very basic ones that kind of always apply, but uh, especially when the regulation gets very specific, there other uh, parts come to play. Um, so there are very, very good reasons in, in every aspect to regulate. So who regulates? Um, we all do. The mainstream does. We call it social norms. Not every regulation has to be put into law. We have social norms that I'm wearing pants when I'm standing here because that's, we have reasons for that. Might be how my legs look or other reasons, but we do that. We have reasons, uh, we, have, we have norms how we interact with each other. When we meet someone new, we introduce ourselves. That has uh, reasons. We don't punch each, each other. Most of us don't. Some do, but most of us don't. Um, we have trade associations that create certain rules for certain aspects. That is different in every country, obviously. In Germany, we have certain things that even come from the Middle Ages that are still in place, where certain uh, jobs are regulated by their peers. It's a sort of a weird system, but it's still intact. Um, we have contracts that regulate certain things, you know, uh, how you interact with uh, certain parties and rights that you have. Uh, but mostly regulation in the meaning that we're going to talk about is by the government. We have laws, we have things that you have to do. And that's basically what regulation means. It's whatever, it's what you can do without being punished. Because whenever you, you uh, act against the sort of regulation we have, you will get punished. Sometimes you just have to pay what you didn't pay before, and sometimes you can even go to jail. In some uh, governments, you might even die. Um, and as I said, every, every community, every country has their own flavor. It's even, uh, I, I gave the example of gun regulation in the United States of America, and Germany is very different. Um, the whole regulation thing in Germany and in the US is very different. It's a very different approach so Germany is kind of more regulatory, write a law, restrict how things work. Uh, the US often seem to be a little more libertarian, you know, don't regulate too much, let it run, let's see how that goes. Uh, but obviously that is a, a, a continuum. You, you shift your, your position between that depending on the context and depending on the community you're in. I mean, even within the, the society, every sort of community or class even has their own sort of regulations and rules. In the end, regulation is about power. Um, you can only regulate something if you have the power to enforce that sort of regulation. You have to be able to say, okay, this, these are the rules we live by. You have to pay taxes. And if you don't, 
we're going to get that money. Because I can, I can state some law here. I can say, OK, the regulation is whoever meets me has to give me five euros. Um, it's hard for me to enforce that kind of thing. Not only because not everyone might have five euros, but because I'm not really a strong dude. And most of you are probably stronger than I am. And then I, I'm out of five euros, probably. Um, and it's not just about enforcing a certain behavior, it's about punishing offenses and misdemeanors. You know, if you create a regulation and you know that everyone's breaking it and you can't enforce it in any way, shape, or form, um, that is not, not real regulation. So uh, you need a certain level of power to be able to regulate. And that power can be kind of distributed because our social norms, there's not one guy or one girl sitting there with a hammer and saying, yes, that was bad. And, no, this was not bad. Because th that is more a decentralized approach where we start seeing certain people don't act the way we want them to act. And we, we start maybe not talking to them anymore. We start limiting what they can do. We do not invite them to our home maybe, something like that. Um, so power is always a part of regulation. And regulation is really everywhere. Every aspect of our life is transcended uh, by some sort of regulation, usually more sorts of regulation. The way we talk, whatever we can say, I can't just stand here and tell lies to you. Then if I start take, uh, talking shit about uh, Michael Seemann there, he can sue me because I'm lying in public. That's, uh, uh, and, that's even, and that's just something that we, we're just talking here. I'm just creating sound waves. Why would anyone punish me for that? But regulation really transcends everything in your life that you can think about, um, almost everything. You can think whatever you want. As soon as you start uttering it, it might be a problem. Um, so regulation is everywhere, but today we're going to look at a very specific part. We're looking at regulating technology and regulating the use of data. And for regulating technology, we had one example as well, but uh, let's look at a few more. We have, as I already said, guns and weapons. Um, we regulate cars. Ha and especially in Germany, we have this it's called TÜV. It, it means it's a sort of a, a legal body where you have to go every year with your car and they look if your car is fit for traffic, if it's good enough. And if it's not rusting everywhere, they tell you, okay, you repair that or you throw the car away. Um, another thing we al also regulate very heavily uh, is nuclear power plants. You can't just buy a nuclear power plant and say, I'm going to have one in my backyard because that's cool. Um, we don't want that because that's really not the safest stuff to have around. Um, and there's a, also a bad example that I want to look at more uh, in the next few slides. Um, a lot of the regulation we have kind of works. I mean, we don't have people running around with guns here in Germany, at least not, not often. Um, the things with the cars works quite well here. I mean, most cars have a certain standard and the level of, of, of accidents we have is actually not that big. Um, and the thing with the nuclear power plants, Nobody builds a nuclear power plant that hasn't paid their taxes and hasn't create the, uh, filled in the proper paperwork. Um, so the regulation of technology we have mostly, or at least many times, works because it has a long history. I mean, guns and weapons are not around for 10 years. They've been around for ages, and we have had swords before and all kinds of stuff. And cars are also not really that, that new because before we had horses and carriages, and we had similar problems. So we had a lot of time to develop that kind of regulation. Um, but whenever we are, we are confronted with a new technology, we seem to tend to make bad decisions because we don't know what the shit we're doing. Um, and let's talk about the German hacker paragraph. For those who don't know it, it's uh, paragraph 202C uh, in the German oh. Code of Law. Uh, and it gives you a punishment for up to one year in prison if you, uh, you're giving access or distributing hacker tools. What is a hacker tool? A hacker tool is basically ping because it's a tool that hackers use to see if they can uh, hack into a server. Um, so that law is obviously stupid and stupid on, on an enterprise level. It's, it's really stupid and you all know that it's stupid because it has because you use ping every day. Every half the programs in your, in your uh, computer use it in some shape or form to see if the server on the other end is there. Or what. And ping is just one example. Obviously, SSH would be a hacker tool as well. Um, rsync would be a hacker tool. Whatever you can think of is a hacker tool. Um, probably your text editor as well. I don't know. Depends on how many plugins you've loaded, maybe. Um, 
But, so we know it's stupid. And we can create many uh, examples for why that is completely absurd what we're doing. But w what's the real problem? The real problem is something that we could call dual use. And that's sh sort of a, a wrong wording because dual use usually means that something can be used in a military and in a civilian context. Um, that's where the word comes from. But we can use it here as well. Dual use technologies lack bias. Some technologies have a certain bias. They, if you have a gun, you're very limited in your options. You can use that gun to shoot at a person. You can shoot at an animal or a wall or whatever. You can shoot. You cannot build something, well, you can probably put a nail into a wall with it, but that's not a very safe thing to do. There might be better tools. So it has a clear bias towards destruction. Um, and that's what makes regulating it very easily. Um, if you have a nuclear power plant and if you decide that you want those, uh, um, it's also really obvious how, how dangerous that sort of thing is and how, how, how dangerous it would be if it comes into the wrong hands. And wrong hands does not mean terrorists, it just means incompetent people. Um, but many technologies are not that simple. They are not obviously bad, obviously dangerous. Uh, the standard example is always the knife. Um, you can harm people with a knife very easily. You can also just cut onions with a knife. A knife is just a very useful tool as well as a possible weapon. Um, Hacker tools can be used for negative things, obviously, but they can be used for the coolest things on this planet. And they are not easily regulated. So regulation is really fucking hard. Um, and especially when it comes to technological objects, it's almost never simple. I can, I mean, if you, even in aspects where at the moment we have sort of a, a vibe of, yeah, that's bad, when we talk about drones, which is, is often seen as a very bad thing at the moment because it's used and developed mainly by the military, we can do many cool things with it. In Russia, people use drones to, to kind of surve surveil themselves when going on demonstrations just to ensure that the police couldn't just claim that the demonstration was violent because it wasn't, so they had created proof with drones. Um, even drones are not just bad, but they can be used in very bad ways. Um, We've seen that overregulation is very bad, as in this hacker paragraph, where people decide, okay, we have a problem, let's regulate, and then they did something immensely stupid. On the other hand, underregulation is bad as well, and I don't know if anyone, if anyone from the US is here, and I don't want to piss anyone off seriously, but uh, I consider the US gun laws very underregulated. You might disagree, it's just an example in my opinion, don't be pissed off, please. Um, but I, I see that as, as a problem as well. If you don't regulate to, uh, enough in a certain aspect, you, you have a problem as well. So what's good regulation? Good regulation is as small as possible because you know we want people to live freely. They shall make their own decisions. And if we don't have to restrict them, let's just let them do what they want. I mean, where's the harm in that if they decide to do that? Um, it has to solve a real problem. You cannot just regulate because you, there might sometimes be a problem. If you can't really say what the problem is you're trying to solve with that regulation, you probably shouldn't regulate. Um, it has to be consistent, and consistency is a really important uh, aspect. It has to fit in with the rest of the rules. Um, we have the rule you can look at everything you want, basically, and if we created a new regulation that said you may not look at things that are red, we'd say no, that's stupid and doesn't fit to any other sort of law that we create. It doesn't fit in there. Um, so consistency is very important, not just because, uh, because of, of it making sense, but also for people who have to follow those rules. Because the rules have a certain train of thought underneath that they understand. And if rules don't fit in there, you see that people start breaking the rules all the time. We have that problem with, the, uh, with copyright at the moment, where the rules don't seem to fit in with how things work in certain aspects where, you know, we're used to sharing information and communicating and then suddenly we may not and we break the rules all the time because they don't fit in with the rest. That's bad regulation if it doesn't fit in with what we do and how we, uh, how we live. Um, and it has to be precise. You have to say, okay, this is what you're allowed to do and this is what you're not allowed to do. And it has to be as clear as possible what you mean there. But you mustn't be too precise, because if you're too precise, we'll come to that example uh, in a few slides, um, you start creating really stupid regulation that you have to change all the time. Um, so 
all of those things are sort of in a continuum as well. Sometimes they don't, uh, it's not really easy to, to specify the real problem precisely. Sometimes you have to, to qualify it a little uh, fuzzy, if you want to say it like that. Or uh, the thing, I want to be consistent and I want it to be as small as possible, might have a contradiction, so you have to find a middle ground there. But those are at least uh, aspects for good regulation. So regulation is hard. And why are we even talking about this? Outside it's nice. Well, as usually in Germany, it's Google's fault. Um, uh, in April the 4th, last year, Google presented the first video of their Google Glass project. It was, um, many of you will have seen this, it wasn't even the product itself, it was how Google imagined it would work in a few years. You had this guy, I think he was in New York, and he was walking around, and people were just, you know, talking to him, and he see, oh yes, your friend wants to meet you for coffee, do you want to go there? And then you had navigation, and he saw um, a poster for a, a concert this evening and could automatically photograph it and buy tickets and all that kind of thing. It was meant as a supporting device for people, obviously in very urban environments. Um, and before we had seen that device, before we knew what was in there what, and what it would actually do, we had a, a tremendous outcry that would only grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the term glass holes was coined rather quickly. Um, the, the concept of gargoyles, as it was described in Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, was cited a lot, you know. It was, no, this is going to be horrible and uh, there's going to be surveillance. The basic criticism was, we're going to create a big surveillance state where everyone's surveilling everyone with their camera and with their microphone. Um, there was one train of thought, everything was surveillance, and Google was obviously a problem because we are in Germany, in fact. Um, there was this uh, instant upload feature where you could just take your pictures and have them up, uh, back up to the Google servers, and that's bad because it's on American servers and no privacy. Um, and Google could run face uh, recognition on that, those pictures and you know, would my, maybe know where certain people were at a certain point. Uh, that was another problem that people had. So the basic criticism was that we would lose trust and privacy. Nobody was going to talk to anyone else anymore because you could never be sure if they were recording you or if they were recording the conversation. Um, people would have their, their privacy uh, destroyed just because someone was in the room who was using this Google Glass and was not even trying to do something bad, but because he was just taking pictures, uh, he was telling Google where people were, and Google would give it to the NSA and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, that was the criticism that instantly came. It wa when that, that video was shown, as I said, before anyone knew any specs, we've had all that kind of thing. And obviously that had uh, an impact on the real world. Um, we had no glass zones. Uh, a Seattle bar was the quickest one um, that had big signs. You may not wear glass by coming in here because you know you might take a picture of someone's pee pee while peeing on the toilet. Um, and because they said, yes, everyone here is getting drunk and if we take pictures, nobody's gonna get drunk. It destroys our business. Um, it was, in fact, in this case, a publicity stunt, as they admitted a few days later. Uh, they never intended to uh, uh, ban Google Glass, but it was a great way to get into every major newspaper. Uh, this was the Wall Street Journal, but you could see it in basically every American paper and some German papers, even. And probably French and all over the planet. Um, but that, was, that is obviously playing catch up. And that is a, a big problem with that sort of regulation. That is if you get too specific. If you say, okay, this bar bans Google Glass. And Google says, yeah, we don't want to be banned in bars because bars are fun, there's going to be fun pictures. Um, let's change the, the form factor a little. Create a, a slightly different project, uh, product. It's not that hard. Um, and then the regulation fits no longer. Um, so uh, other people realized that quite uh, quickly and said, okay, we need a broader approach for that. And they created not just for this aspect, but for uh, a similar aspect, uh, stop cyborgs, because cyborgs are bad. Um, this also is connected to the NSA thing, but as you see, this is the Google uh, Glass thingy, uh, even in the logo, stop cyborgs, um, forbid that kind of technology in general, everywhere, not just in bars in Seattle. Um, it kind of has a vibe of the Butlerian Jihad from Dune, you know, thinking machines need to die. Um, but they got a point. I mean, it's not that this website is really that great of a, a thing, but they pointed out a, a similar 
a real big problem that I'm going to come to in a second, but just to clear things up for the record, glass provides nothing new. The technology in there is basically your smartphone typed to your face. It's nothing more than that. The, it's, it's even worse than that because the screen sucks. It's <laughs> tiny and has really low quality. The, the headphones suck even worse. You can barely listen to anything. Um, and the camera is not even that great as well. Um, every smartphone you have here, and probably everyone in this room has one, uh, can do the same things uh, and can do those things even, even more secret. Because I could have my phone taping everything in this room at the moment, and you wouldn't even see that I have it. I have it in my pocket, and it's not recording anything, but it could do. Um, and for the whole, yes, you might take pictures of people, um, and right now it's hard because I would have to take my smartphone and direct it at you and take a picture. Um, uh, you can buy for about 100 euros uh, sunglasses that have integrated HD cameras and about 32 gigabytes of storage. Um, that is way more than Google Glass has. With I think they have 16 gigabytes and most of it is, isn't even usable for that kind of thing. And Google Glass has battery lifetime for about four hours. Um, and with that camera, you can basically record your whole day. And there are more projects like that. There's a, a Mimoto camera that you can just have an a lanyard around your neck uh, and it just takes a photo every 30 seconds and stores them every day, all day. Um, so just Glass didn't really provide something new, but it made something visible that many people chose to ignore because it was so convenient. Um, let's get back to cyborgs. I just love saying that and that slide is awesome. Um, cyborgs, uh, a cyborg or a cybernetic organism uh, is a being with both organic and cybernetic parts. Again, Wikipedia. And uh, I don't know, some people of you who don't uh, speak German might not have seen it. Yesterday, Enno Park gave a great talk about cyborgs. Uh, and he also said that we believe when we think about cyborgs, we think about Robocop or the Terminator. And you know, it's always sci-fi and it's a few years away and we're gonna see it. But no, we're already there. Uh, Enno talked about his, his uh, implant. He has a hearing problem and he has this cochlea implant that allows him to hear quite well, actually. Um, so he obviously fulfills that, that category, but most of us do. Uh, this thing is part of me. It's part of my mental exoskeleton. It knows where I have to be in an hour. I don't. It, it knows the email addresses of the people I want to talk to, and I don't. Phone numbers, all that kind of thing. A lot of my brain is in there, or in the cloud that is connected to that. It's part of me, and many technological devices are part of us. Um, <coughs> We always have externalized things. We have written our contacts in, in little books. And even that could, with a certain stretch, uh, be used to construct us as, as cyborgs. But especially now that electronics get, uh, get smaller and more powerful, um, we can no longer ignore that, that we are cyborgs. And that, make, that creates sort of a backfire when trying to regulate things like Google Glass. Because, um, what we basically did is that we've declared uh, technological devices like hearing aids, like certain art kinds of glasses, um, like smartphones, maybe even accounts that we have online, maybe your Twitter account, I don't know. Um, we've, create, we've declared that part of us because we've, we've, we've understood that we're cyborgs, that means that they belong to us. And that makes regulation hard because um, saying, okay, you can buy this car, but we can take it away and you can still live, um, it's fine. But as soon as we start regulating you as a person in your, in your internal structure, it's really hard. We sometimes see that when people decide that they were born in the wrong body and they want to change that because you know they just realize it's not their body, they want a different gender. Um, how long they had to fight to be able to make that, that change? Because somebody just regulated and said, no, you may not. We, you may not have that operation and that treatment. Um, and we've understood, no, no, you are in control about you and you have to decide what belongs in there and what you want to do with that. It's hard to regulate. When the famous book 1987 that sometimes get quoted when we talk about uh, all this technological nonsense, um, we say that you know, thought crime, which is regulated there, you may not think whatever you want, is horrible. But that's something that people who are trying to ban certain technological enhancements are basically doing this, saying yes, you may perceive things with the organs that evolution gave you, 
but you may not perceive it with things that might give you, get you up to speed with others. Um, but people are not stupid who, who uh, ask for that sort of regulation and they say, yeah, we're not really regulating the devices. We don't care about the devices, the problem is what people do with it. Uh, we're regulating how, they, how people are, are treating and processing data. Because the data is the dangerous thing, it's surveillance creates data and data allows us to say things. So what is data? Um, obviously data is a cyborg, but that's not the point in this case. Um, let's make a short philosophical detour and it's not gonna hurt, really, it's, it's gonna be fine. Um, we're talking about the mind, the body, and the world. Um, you are a mind. You have this thing where you think, where you know things, where you make decisions, um, where you have emotions, where you love people and hate people and can't stand people. And that mind that you have runs on hardware, on your body and your brain. Um, there are many different philosophies of how that works. Uh, we're not going to get into that, but you have this mind and obviously in some ways it's connected to your body because if I put certain chemicals in your body, your state of mind changes. So there seems to be a connection. Let's just ignore how it is because we could argue for years about that. Um, it's just there. Um, how do you, as this mind, access the world? And we're just going to assume that there is a world because it's boring if there isn't. Um, your hardware creates data from the world. You have eyes, you have ears, you have fingers that you can use um, and they create data. You do not, you never touch anything in the real world. When I touch this monitor, my, my hand gives me data that something is there, but I never know if I really touched anything. So everything my mind has to make decisions on, everything my mind operates with is data because my mind is basically software and you know that from your computer, it's the same there. Your software never interacts with the world. You always have like a, a sensor that gives you bits and, and, and bytes that you then interpret as, okay, yeah, this is a distance. It might be. Um, but you as a person only have data. Data is everything that you not are, but everything that you can even interact with. Uh, that's just the quick end, uh, the end of the quick detour. Uh, so data is the representation of a part of reality. Uh, everything, that we inter everything that allows us to interact with reality, with other people, is codified by data. Names, ages, colors, distances, we can all express them as data, but without interpretation, that this data is nothing. What is 33? It might be a distance in meters to someone in this room. It might be my age. Whatever, it is my age, but it might also mean certain other things. It could be a price. I don't know. Um, and this interpretation is very, very relevant. We see that um, in many different cases. Uh, for example, some of you might have been to London. There is uh, Madame Tussauds wax cabinet where they have famous people and uh, let's call them puppets or statues made from wax that kind of look like them. And they, those are objects. And it shows that um, if you sometimes see if they made a good good job with their statue and you have the person and the statue standing next to each other and they're looking the same. Um, the data even looks kind of the same so you start collecting data to decide how to deal with it because one thing is a person that you have to be nice to that you might admire and like and the other is a shitty piece of wax that you don't really care about. So even if the data kind of lines up you start gathering more data to to decide what to do with the world that you don't even access. Um, in, in the usual interpretation in science, you, s you have this, this, uh, this three-step process. You have data, and you turn the data into information by adding an interpretation. And we often stumble about that, you know. Uh, sometimes we say this 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1 could be a JPEG. Um, it could also not be. Uh, CryptoCat had a problem with that, you know. They had this blob of data, and they thought, yeah, this is an integer, maybe it's not. So. Uh, that creates problems as well. And we as people do that all the time um, because uh, the data we get sucks. Our eyes, for example, suck. And we, we've all seen those pictures where you look at it and you see, don't know, a dolphin and other people see a naked woman. Uh, there are many of those illusions around. The data that, that we get and the interpre uh, interpretation that we do really sucks. Uh, but it's the only way for us to, to gain any knowledge. Data is our access to the world. So if data is everything we have to do something with the world, it's the base of every thought that makes it really hard to regulate because 
we cannot regulate into the minds of people. That's something that we, that we don't allow in other aspects, so we shouldn't allow it here. And that's not consistent with, with the, the rest of the laws that we have. Um, the, the distinction between our natural data gathering, me looking at you and seeing this guy has a red shirt, this guy has a red pants, this guy has a black shirt, um, saying, okay, I can do that all day, I can see every one of you all day, and I can remember everything about this, uh, but if I use a technological device, I may, may, may not, even though it's kind of the same thing, I'm putting data into my brain to make decisions. Um, that's really a difficult path to take, and that, that distinction grows more and more arbitrary. If you think about Enno Park again, with his implant, um, he's using digital microphones to hear, Everything he hears and every data that goes into his mind that is audible data has gone through a microphone and through an electronic preprocessor. And as he said, it's trivial to plug in a hard drive and save everything he hears all day. Completely trivial. Um, so regulating that based on the idea that some data is binary and electronical and therefore is magically different from the other data is really a problem and doesn't line up with the rest because why should I not be allowed to do that just because I use a certain device that allows me to do that as well as others. Um, so after having understood all that, let's regulate glass because it's time. I mean, I promised some sort of regulation here. Um, and there are, different, there are different parts of regulating glass. Um, and just Enno Park said that way better. Um, there is this idea that if you put something in your body, so like his, his uh, implant, you should own it. You should be root on your hearing aid. You should be root on your smartphone. You should be root on your visible aid, obviously. That's not the sort of regulation I'm talking about here, even though that is a very important part. Uh, the, the idea that we are not not the super user on our devices is horrible and we need to fight that and we need to create regulation there. But the regulation we're talking about here is mainly connected to uh, what I uh, described as criticism earlier. It's mainly connected to this idea of privacy and, and uh, those things. So the legal rules is, in my opinion, just that. You may not publish video or audio recordings of others without explicit consent, unless it's a public situation. You know, if you're out there and there's a big party, you can just take a picture. Um, and that is interesting because that is consistent with what we do already. I can take a picture of you, but I may not publish it if I didn't ask you. But taking the picture is really not the problem. The problem is that I may not publish it. And this does not overregulate perception. I can use, for example, Google Glass to enhance my vision. I, for example, have a horrible... Uh, hover, hor hor I can't remember names. I really can't. It's, it sucks, but I can't. Uh, if I had a device that would scan faces and would just attach the name to it, that would be splendid. Seriously, I, I wouldn't look like an ass who doesn't care about other people. I do, but I just can't remember your names. It's, I, I know it's, it, it's a weak excuse, but it's really a problem for me. Um, and we wouldn't restrict that kind of thing. We wouldn't restrict people using technology to just help them navigate the world, help them interact with people. But we would give people protection because, yes, there might be situations where, where you don't want your picture taken and published. Many of them. I mean, everybody can think of those, for example. Um, but everything else that we could regulate here, we could say, yes, you may not take a picture, uh, you may only take the picture but not process it in any way, would start to create would start to regulate into the brains of people. Because if you say you may not you may take a picture but not process it, because processing is, is dangerous. Yeah, but some people might not be able to, to handle this, this flow of pictures. They might need a way to reduce the data that they get in, to be able to handle it even. Uh, the picture might be too bad because the light is not great, so we have a processor that uh, lightens up the picture, that you can see anything on there. Um, regulating that kind of thing is really hard, and I, I would call it overreaching. Um, but that's only the legal aspect. You can regulate in non-legal non ways. Um, and yes, that means you can not possibly go to the police and say he did that and please punish him, but we have social ways to punish people. If people behave like bad people, we will not integrate them into our uh, society anymore. So the social glass rules, which are also regulation, is the first one is don't be an ass. <laughs> That's just good advice. Um, 
Uh, the second rule is if people ask you to deactivate, just do so. I mean, s obviously this is, doesn't always work because you might really need it, um, but most of the time, if somebody asks you to do something, just do it. And yes, it might inconvenience you, but again, don't be an ass. I mean, people will tell you that they have a need, um, and even if that need might not be yours, just respect it. Um, be transparent with what you do. Don't pretend, yes, I'm not recording, but record. Just say, yes, uh, I, have, I have Google Glass on and I use it for this or that if somebody asks you. Don't lie, because that, that destroys trust. If you're honest, people can ask you, okay, I'm not, I don't want to be recorded. Can you turn it off? And then you turn it off because you're all nice, because you're sitting here and listening to me ramble on. Um, another thing is don't assume. Because it's easy to assume, it's easy to assume that your perspective is the right one and the one that everyone else has. That, that your need for privacy is exactly the same need for privacy that others have. Or your, your lack of need for privacy is the same lack of need for privacy that everyone else has. That's not, that's not true. And even if the person next to you is having really weird, uh, weird ideas of, yeah, I don't want to have my picture taken because it takes my soul away, that's their beef. And if they just said it, don't. Don't torture them by taking their picture. I mean, it, it's really not worth it. Um, again, don't be an ass. And I guess that with that sort of approach, we can really get there. And it fits also to the rest of the, of the world. Because we have so many social rules of how to, to deal with, with bad behavior. If people, if people are really rude, you're not going to deal with them. You probably will ask them, can you not call me X, Y, or Z, and if they, stop, if they don't stop doing that, you will stop interacting with them. They come, you go. And we have a very sim similar code of, of rules here. Um, a few final thoughts, uh, because it's already late and I've uh, put in too many examples. Uh, a few final thoughts. Regulation seems, always seems to be simple. Uh, you can say, yeah, glass, nobody needs that, it's Google, and take it away. Uh, that looks like a good decision, but as I said, it, it's just a, an illustration of how we integrate technology into us. And if we start regulating like that, we can say, yeah, smartphones, they can do really bad stuff, so let's just regulate smartphones away. The next thing is let's regulate computers where you can compile your own code away, because you could build profiling al algorithms there, and those are bad. Or you could build the next Facebook, which is even worse, or the next Google, which is triple worse. Um, it looks simple, but it tends not to work because it doesn't fit to how we really interact. Uh, and that fits to the fact that glass is, glass is really nothing new. Glass is, glass is just the conversation sta starter for a situation that we have ignored for, for quite a while, where we, where we thought, okay, we've created technology regulation in the 70s where some people had mainframes and then created data protection laws and you know uh, restrictions of what can be done and today your smartphone has more processing power than most governments had 20 years ago. Um, the, the, we've ignored that problem and Glass just punches us in the face and says, deal with it. That's just the problem where, where we have this big discussion about it. But the device itself is nothing new. And also cyborgization, so us becoming more cyborgs, has been going on for ages and gains more speed. So um, we have to start really talking about what that means for, for the sort of regulation that we have to do. Um, and the problem right now is that we have a typo in the last slide and that uh, we have no broad consensus anymore. It used to be that a few years ago everyone was kind of on the same page because things were similar. Everyone had a car and some cars were nicer but everyone had a car. But um, we've all know, we all know this, this quote, the future is there but it's not evenly distributed and that's more true than ever because some of you live online, really. For me, the smartphone is part of my brain, it is. But for my mom, it's not, and for my dad, even less. And some people really don't care about the internet. Just take it away, I don't like technology. I want to live on a farm and create my own cheese. Um, we have very different levels, so the consensus that we've had before that made regulation simpler is no longer there. But that means we have to start a discussion, and we have to start it now. And we have to bring all those perspectives to the table and find a way to create rules that allow people the freedom to explore that way of allowing them new forms of technology, uh, of, of new forms of communication, of collaboration, while not forgetting that other peoples have probably needs 
that might not always be reasonable, but who cares? You know, if they have needs, let's see if we can meet them somewhere in between, uh, in the middle. Um, just forbidding things is really bad advice. It looks uh, simple, but it just creates problems, as we've seen with a hacker paragraph, where we've had a tool and said, yeah, it's bad, let's ban it, and it just creates problems. It makes most people in this room uh, criminals, and that's really not the same thing to do. So thank you for listening on this beautiful summer day in Cologne. Uh, I spent a little too much time. Thank you. <laughs> you can, you can you get the slides up? there if you want to have it. If you want to add up or ask questions, there's a microphone here. Could you go back to your slide where you have the social glass rules? The, the what? The social glass rules. Yes, uh, if I find my, where is the, oh, there. Yeah, I would like to ask, what about um, the rule, don't ask people to deactivate if you don't, if it's not necessary? I had thought about putting that in there. Um, but then I thought, that's just really, uh, don't be an ass. <laughs> because that, no, that, that's really uh, the point of, yes, uh, I force my view of the world upon you. And I need to have a really good reason for that. I mean, if, if you're rude, I can tell you, I, I find that rude and it hurts me. That is something I can say. But just saying, yeah, you know, I, I don't know, just deactivate it. You have no basis for that, really. That's just you being an ass. And I think that's not really a, a good way to, to deal with it. I mean, we should cut each other way more slack. You're all very smart and nice, and I know that you're not trying to harm anyone. And if you do something that I might feel harms me, that's probably because I didn't tell you what harms me and what I don't like. So I tell you, and you will probably just change your, de your behavior then, because you're great. Um, but some people are, um, are not an ass, but they are paranoid. And I think a lot of people uh, around these conferences like this uh, have this issue and um, they, they wouldn't agree that they are assholes just because they just generally don't want to be um, on, any, uh, on, on any photograph. Yes, and that is, I mean, that discussion has been brewing for the last year. Um, in this case, I would really say and um, most people will probably not believe me, but I would just deactivate it. If there's a famous guy in, in Germany who, was, he, who became famous by claiming that we should just punch people who use glass and destroy it. Um, um, if he told me, yes, you're wearing glass and I'm gonna punch you, I'd say, can we maybe not punch me and I just deactivate it? I, <laughs> it's, it's the same thing as you said before. I mean, a person can just be an ass by, by telling me, yes, deactivate it just because fuck you, that's why. But on the other hand, I can't just sit here and say, yes, I want to have it running just because fuck you, that's why. I mean, don't be an ass is, is true for the people who are being filmed as well as for the people doing the filming. I mean, it's just try to, to be explicit about what you want and why you want it, start a conversation, and maybe even the problem just dissolves. Because the guy next to you sees, yeah, you're just gonna upload it all to Google, and you say, yeah, no, I, I uh, got the firmware, I hacked it together, I destroyed all the Google stuff on there, and I just use it to create funny Nyancat videos of the real world, and that guy would say, okay, can I try this? So, I mean, that is also a, a way to, to, f to start the discussion about this, to get, to get to know different perspectives, and maybe create a, a more formalized set of rules than this that I just brain farted here on some slide. You said you would just deactivate it if someone asked you to, but what about the people who use it for something that really helps them and they really need it, to, for example, to, to um, recognize faces? What about people who can recognize faces and they really need it to recognize faces and someone says turn it off and so they lose this ability by turning it off? I think many people don't realize that for example, this whole, I can't uh, distinguish faces. I can distinguish faces, I just can't remember names. Um, many people don't realize how, how much of a problem that is. I mean, that's true with everything. If, if you can hear properly, you don't understand how a hearing aid can change your life because suddenly you can participate in, in society. Um, and th I think that's, again, a point where you just have to be explicit. And I think even if I told Padaloon, dude, I have, 
I need this to be able to interact with people and I promise I'm not gonna upload it somewhere. I think even then it's possible to start a conversation. And if you, if you explain it like that, say, yeah, it's not just me being you know, a tech geek and I just want to buy everything Google does, but I have a real reason for that. He would never say, you may not use uh, an implant to hear, even though he, everybody could use that to create recordings. I, he's not unreasonable, I mean, he's, he's got a point. It's, I think we are just at the point where we have to, to start the discussion. And actually people who, who really need a device like that, I mean, nobody really has it at the moment, except a few tech geeks, um, they can use it to start a reasonable discussion about this. And we should just not just limit ourselves to glass. I mean, glass is just the fancy thing at the moment, but more th things like that are gonna pop up in the next few months. And not just one or two. Everything is gonna start integrating more into us because that's what we want. At least many of us want that because it helps us to be better. And uh, I wrote an article about that directly after I saw that because um, I think those devices start giving us, the normal people, the, the tools that rich people have at the moment anyways. Because they don't need to remember people's names, they have their assistant who tells, yeah, by the way, that is Mr. So-and-so. And then, Mr. So-and-so, great to meet you. Uh, and they look like they can do that, but they can't. They just have the money to pay people to help them do that. This is just technology that helps everyone to do that. And it's cheaper, and it helps us all to interact better with each other. And it has problems, I'm not ignoring that, obviously. Uh, for example, that it's not easy to be rude on your device and other things. But I think the, we should not just, in, Ger in German we uh, say don't just das uh, Baby mit dem Bade ausschütten. So don't, don't overreach here because I think the discussion is really important. Since it appears to me that you d um, developed your own ways to deal with your society, was there ever a point in your life when you thought, I hate the fucking state, I could do all regulation better? I hated fucking society and I want to expecrate. I'm a nerd, obviously I believe I can do everything better than everyone else. But no, <laughs> um, no. Um, when I was younger I was, I was jaded, obviously. Um, because, you know, when you're young you probably have the right to be so. But at some point you realize that people who are, who are creating those regulations, they are not trying to be evil or trying to piss you off, they have good reasons. And you have to start the discussions, why are you doing that? And you have to convince them if there is bad regulations, uh, why it's bad and why they need to change it. I mean, we've had this hacker paragraph thing and even politicians are starting, some are starting to realize that this might have been stupid. And maybe we've done a bad job of explaining why it is stupid. I don't know. Or they weren't listening before, there are many different reasons, but uh, no, I, d I don't think I can just decide everything. Even though I would love to be the Minister of Interior in Germany. I really do. Um, I have the feeling you're, you're talking a lot about uh, social rules and very few only about uh, uh, legal rules. So I become the, the feeling um, you think social rules are better than legal rules. And that's what I'm questioning. I'm, I'm not really sure if you're saying that, but that's my feeling. And um, I'm questioning it for my feeling is that social rules can always um, be up in a group and you can you can consider them um, to talk about them um, but the great thing about legal regulation is that it needs to be a law and it normally has a big debate about in the whole society and afterwards um, you have some regulation which are democratic ways gone through so they might be the best at least that is what we hope from a, de a democracy. Um, so what do you think about that? Um, how much do you think that don't know, um, legal regulation um, would be useful or not at all? Um, dumbing that slide down to this was really hard because I thought I, I would need more of the rules. And I thought many of the things that I put in here or kind of put in here, I thought they should be in here, but I always stumbled on problems because glass is really a device that starts, it's part of, of this whole thing about communication. It's a, it's a lot to do with communication, with interaction with people. And I think it's really a building laws that start regulating how you can interact with people is really a slippy slope. I'm, I'm very careful with that sort of thing. I don't want to restrict how you talk to each other too much. I don't want to, I believe in, in being able to say many things 
I mean, there are there are obviously things that we don't want to say. Uh, you're not allowed to deny the Holocaust, and I think that re regulation is important. But regulating what people may say, how they see the world, I think that's very, very dangerous. So uh, I decided against putting more in. Uh, if you have a good legal concept that can serve there, I'm, I put it in. I have no problem with that. I just wasn't able to build one that I didn't see becoming a problem. That's why I relied so much on social rules, because with communication, we've communicated for a while now. Well, not we, but you know, we. Um, and I think that social rules have worked there quite well. Because most of us are not insulting people all the time. Some of us are, but they are usually isolated then. So I think that has been a success story, and I think we should just follow that success story. But as I said, if you have great rules, I don't think that there is not more room for legal regulation there. I, I do think there is. I just wasn't able to, to find a way to put it in there that doesn't destroy good things. Um, for me, is, uh, one thing that's disturbing me most is that the data is going directly to Google. It's no problem that someone is uh, filming me with this stuff, but that Google has uh, his foot into my door. And that is what I don't want. And this is uh, how can we handle this? Um, for Glass, it's actually rather simple because uh, some hacker just uh, dumped the whole code base and you can just rip Google out. Yeah, so but uh, I think 90% of the people buy this stuff and use it as it is, and that is a problem. Yeah, but <laughs> I have to say I'm, I'm an optimist, and actually I like people. Many people don't believe me if I say that, but I do. I, I really like people. Um, and I think that most people are awesome, and I trust you. And I know that if you take a picture of me, you can go home, load it to your computer, and put a penis on my face. You can do that. I know that. But I know that you're not going to do that because you're a nice person. And I think that most people here are nice. And if, obviously, we can say, we can talk about if there is a problem with, with the uploading thingy to Google, even though it has benefits, for example. I use photos from my phone. I upload them to Google. I just don't automatically publish them. It's just a nice way to back up. I could use Dropbox as well or my own rsync scripty thingy, whatever. Um, I think we, again, this is a point where we just have to start trusting each other. Yeah. Because you cannot control what people do with those kinds of devices. Yeah, this is You can, uh, but, but you cannot. You can never. Y yeah. The person that takes a picture of you uh, opens it on their Windows computer. And Microsoft uploads every picture that Windows opens to the NSA. I don't know. They could. Um, and you cannot control that. But and this so is uh, but this is more fluent. This is everyone is uh, putting pictures to Google, and they can process it and build and a better service, and they'll upload it to your service. Yeah. And you're trustworthy, so you're you're but the next star on the next conference. No, really, it's. I don't see. I really don't see. I, I see where. I see your problem, but I don't think that we can regulate there in a way that doesn't destroy too much. But I, I see your point. I mean, and that is something that we have to talk about. And I think that this. Um, I would even be willing to say, okay, Google is not allowed to turn on auto-upload when this thingy is delivered to you, which actually I think it's not at the moment, at least not with the Google Plus uh, app on the phone. It doesn't automatically upload. It asks you if you want that or if you don't want that before it does anything. And I think that is a reasonable thing because you have to say, okay, uh, the people around me, they can make decisions and they are smart and they try to make good decisions. Because if you say, no, they're just going to make horrible decisions, then well, you have a, a bigger problem than just Google. <laughs> okay, um, for the legal uh, as, um, rules versus uh, social rules, um, just one example. For, for example, in file sharing, you see if the legal rules and the social rules are too far apart, then the people will, will not respect the legal rules. So you need legal rules, but I think before the legal rules, you need the social um, rules and the social norms. That's my opinion. Yes. Uh, obviously, ru legal rules often emerge from social rules yeah. because you start, okay, yeah. these social contexts make sense, so let's just put them to law to be able to s use the police to enforce them. But um, I think in this file sharing thingy, it has a lot to do with consistency because, you know, if you have a CD, you can give it to your friend and he listens to it and says, yeah, that is a cool CD. But now you have an MP3, and suddenly you can no longer share it. That it's not consistent with how we usually act, and that's where all this problem emerges from. And as I said, consistency is really underrated, in my perspective. 
perspective and when we start regulating the whole internet thing because we start regulating things there that we could never regulate in the physical world. If we started regulating the physical world like people try to regulate the internet, people would go apeshit. We distinguish between social rules and laws because social rules don't last that long. No, because social rules are just not written into law and you can't use the police to enforce them. Well, um, the problem with the regulation on real world and internet is that most people still live in the real world and not on the internet, so there's more people to go ape shit. Also, um, it's more like a call and less like a question, but I'm also bad at recognizing names, so if anyone's bored and has some time to write an app for that or something, I think there's a big market behind it. Yes, uh, half the people I talked to about Glass have exactly that problem and would just love to have people's names over their heads bubbling around, maybe with icons and cat pictures and that. I would like cat pictures. Also, a smartphone app would be fine. Okay, thank you. No more comments? Thank you for investing all this time here. I know it's nicer outside. I appreciate it.